Okay, so uh, let's move on to the second lecture. I just wanted to flag the readings. Uh, you probably got all this in your uh, handout in the list of slides. So uh, you know, do so. Th th this is a fairly uh, good place to start for uh, the you know reading on this, this field. Um, okay, so. Okay, so the aim of the second part of the uh, lecture today is to uh, do two things. One is to uh, bring markets into the center stage. Um, and the second thing is to give you a sense of where I think some of the most exciting work um, on, on networks is at the moment. Um, so to give you a sense of ongoing work and uh, probably, uh, you know, also thirdly, to give you a sense of how to combine theory with experiments uh, naturally. I think this is a, um, you know, what uh, I think is sometimes referred to as low hanging fruits. Uh, I think often we don't really fully understand networks, behavior in networks and experiments is a very good way to uh, tease that behavior out and uh, do identification of network effects and so on. So I think it's a very promising and uh, there's very little, relatively little work on, on experiments and networks. So three aims and all in about an hour. Okay, so, uh, so the point of departure of uh, this uh, project, which is uh, uh, you know, by the way, all joint work with an ongoing joint work with, with Andrea Gagliotti and Singh Ju Choi is that in, in many examples, and here's, here's one example. So supposing I'm in, I live in London and I want to go and see an exhibition at, at, at the Louvre in, in Paris, uh, I could take the underground, the bus or the taxi to the Eurostar and then once I'm in Paris, I could take the metro, the bus, or the taxi to the Louvre. And that simple choice problem you could represent in this form where you have these different privately operated players, the underground in London, the bus, and the taxi. They're setting prices. The Eurostar is setting prices, likewise in Paris. And what I want to do is to pick a path that uh, gets me from home to Louvre in, in, you know, in the best possible way. And uh, so um, what I'm really looking at here is a pricing problem in networks. Uh, these guys are all setting prices and they know there is demand flowing through this network. And uh, so many different contexts one could think of this pricing problem. Here's another example. Um, we are all familiar with the fair trade movement and the fair trade movement arose because there was a feeling that in some, uh, some, some crops, some products like coffee, tea, and, and uh, farmers were not getting a fair price. And uh, really to understand what's happening to pricing in these networks and you know, margins and, and, and efficiency, uh, the problem, for instance, in the coffee supply chain is there's a farmer, there are local intermediaries, there's an exporter, there are brokers, there's a roaster like Nestle, there are typically grocery chains in between and there's a consumer. And at each level you have interconnections between these different vertical layers. And uh, they're all setting prices uh, and they are, um, uh, the farmer sells to the highest price downstream, uh, the local intermediary then sells to the highest price downstream and so on. It's like a bid-ask model. And again, the question is how does the structure uh, shape prices, shape market prices, uh, margins and define market power. Okay. And uh, the thought was that somehow there were too many margins in between the consumer and the farmer and therefore you needed to somehow set up an alternative chain uh, to, to get more of the surplus to the farmer. Okay. So what we are trying to do in this project, and this is, as I said, all joint work with Singh Ju Choi at UCL and, and Andrea Galliotti at Essex, is uh, we have one completed paper and a number of uh, things ongoing, is to study uh, these sort of problems. Okay, pricing in um, 
complicated chains uh, to understand market power and uh, understand questions of industrial organization. So when different players want to merge, what implications does it have for market power and um, uh, welfare? Okay, so that, those are the kinds of um, questions we want to address. And uh, what I'm going to do is to walk you through this uh, first paper, walk you through some of the ideas. And um, time permitting, I'll then um, give, take you back to the complement substitutes problem and talk a little bit about the general setting. Okay. Uh, before we move on, I should say that these networks are created by players entering and exiting. So there's a network formation problem, uh, which is inherent in the study of these uh, sorts of networks. And more generally, there is this whole interest now in fragile, fragility of supply chains. And uh, so, in fact, there's a very nice set of questions relating to whether there are the right incentives to enter in the right places in the network to make the network resilient, or is there good reason to believe that systematically these networks will be fragile? Okay. And so there are a number of very, very nice problems, and uh, we actually are at a very early stage in this um, uh, understanding these questions. Okay, so uh, it's a very, very, uh, from an applied perspective, it's actually a fascinating problem because in many of these uh, uh, contexts, the market has been liberalized greatly, which in other words means there are many more private uh, players, profit maximizing players, the state has withdrawn and so, uh, and the effects have been very mixed, and uh, there's very little general sort of theoretical understanding of why is it that the effects are so mixed. In some countries, farmers do a lot better when the state withdraws from these chains. In other countries, farmers do not well at all. So, and people don't really understand. Uh, those kinds of questions require a theoretical framework for the understanding of pricing and market power. Okay, so this is the simplest a way of thinking about this. There is a source and a destination. There are end traders and between the source and destination, they are sitting on these different paths and you've got to traverse a path to get from S to D. There's a surplus between the source and destination and in the simplest setting that surplus is known, so it's a, uh, this is going to be very much in the spirit of what we did earlier. It's, the network is fully, it's completely known, the surplus is known and uh, so um, okay, so, so in this benchmark model, all that matters is uh, whether you're on the cheapest path. So define Q star as a set of cheapest paths. Uh, and uh, so if you are a player, if you're on the cheapest path, then you're going to get some um, profits. Um, that's the price that you have set. You're going to get it. Uh, you're going to get it in proportion to the probability that you are picked. If there's only one cheapest cost path and you will be picked for sure and your profit will be PI, but if there are many cheapest cost paths, then it depends on how many of them you lie. Okay, and we study the Nash equilibrium of this game. Okay. Okay, so let me, just to get you thinking about this, let me first solve the problem in the transport network. Okay, so here's the home in London, and you have three local transport routes, and then you go to the Eurostar, and again in Paris you have three options, and that takes you to uh, the Louvre. Okay. So if the surplus is one, a natural equilibrium in this model um, and is, is going to be one where the competing layers, like in this one here, the first layer, local transport, they are competing, uh, they all set a price zero. Uh, the Eurostar, which is lying on all paths, extracts all the surplus, sets a price one. And the, 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 the transport providers in Paris, again, set a price zero. 
So, this is a possible um, outcome and you can check that in this very simple setting, this is a Nash equilibrium because this player here, the underground, can't do any better because if it were to raise its price, it will be just ignored because it, there is a route that circumvent that can sidestep this underground. Similarly, any of the operators in Paris, if it wants to raise its price, well, you know, it will be, it will get none of the demand because there are two other parts that are much cheaper. Uh, and finally, because the surplus was assumed to be one, uh, the Eurostar doesn't have any incentives for raising its price. Okay. So that's a very simple outcome where um, all the surplus goes to one player. Okay. Now you can ask what other outcomes can arise in this uh, model and a very simple outcome uh, that can arise is a breakdown. Okay. So here's a simple way of thinking about the breakdown you have these three players. And what could happen is that all the traders set a price one. It's not a very interesting outcome, but you can see that if everyone set a price, set, has set a price one, there is no trade because it's much larger, the, the cost of any of these parts is three, and the surplus is just one. It's not a very interesting equilibrium, but it gives you a sense of how you can have breakdown, um, and you can have uh, breakdown outcomes. Okay? So let's just keep that uh, in mind. It's, it's a very good way of starting thinking about this problem, uh, because what we want to do is to solve this uh, game for arbitrary networks between S and D. Okay, so here's a, um, so I, I won't spend a lot of time doing uh, the details of the proof here, but in this very simple benchmark model, uh, what this theorem is saying is, uh, it's saying that in any network that you can give me, there will always exist an efficient equilibrium. Uh, notice an efficient equilibrium in this setting is simply one where there is trade. Okay. So full surplus is realized. And not only that, the theorem also gives you a full characterization of all possible equilibria. Okay. And so what I'll do is um, I've already given you a sense of two of the equilibria. And so what's really happening here is let me walk you through uh, the, the result and, and then I'll try and uh, give you a sense of some of the, uh, the, the key concept that I would like to, to get across using this result. Okay, so the first step is that there always exists an efficient equilibrium and to show that um, the way the proof works is imagine you take any network and think of define the notion of a critical player. Okay, so a node, so we're going to define a node as critical Um, if it lies on all parts. So now you can see that in this particular network, uh, there is one net node that's critical, right, which is this node here. None of the other nodes are critical because they don't lie on all parts. So one way of constructing equilibria is to assign a price zero to all the non-critical nodes and assign a price, positive price to the critical nodes. Okay. So the construction then, you take any network G and you split it into critical nodes and non-critical nodes. All the non-critical nodes you assign a price zero And the critical nodes, you assign them some positive price such that the prices add up to one. Okay. And the claim is that any such configuration is a Nash equilibrium. And the argument is that if a non-critical node 
deviates by setting a positive price, then it will never be in an actively traded route. Because there is always, because by construction it's non-critical, so there is a, another path which does not involve this non-critical node. So you can always travel along that path and that will be cheaper. Okay. And the critical nodes, you have to traverse them because by, by definition they are lie on all paths. And they sum to one. So uh, none of these nodes can increase their price because if they increase their price, trade breaks down. Okay. So, so this is a very simple um, set of arguments that tells you that whenever you have, uh, for any network, I can construct an efficient equilibrium. This is efficient because whenever there is no critical trader, I set all prices to zero and this tra trade for show. If there is a critical trader, they extract the whole surplus, but trade occurs for show. So, so it's an efficient outcome. And the characterization tells us that really there are, those are the only two interesting outcomes. Either the intermediaries extract all the surplus or uh, the source and destination retain all the surplus. That's the uh, content of the first statement in the characterization. Okay. Um, okay, so the only bit that I want to spend a bit of time on is the argument that if you have critical traders, then uh, you must have, it's a sufficient condition for full surplus extraction. Why is that? If you have a critical trader and full surplus has not been extracted, well, if I'm a critical trader, I have a margin. I can push up my price and you will still trade because you have some surplus left. Uh, so that's very simply the argument why if there's a critical trader, all surplus must go to um, uh, the, the traders. Okay. Um, okay, so... So what, what I want to do next is to show you um, a familiar culprit in this uh, today, which is multiple equilibria. So here's an example of a network, very simple network. There are two paths, one, two, and three, four. And you can see that all the outcomes I have outlined are possible in this. So you can have a situation where the equilibria are for all the traders to set price zero. That's an equilibrium. This is the source. You have another equilibrium where one and two miscoordinate. So they set prices one each. So they're out of business. And then this path becomes essentially critical, and these guys extract price, for example, half each. But it could be any division of the surplus that adds up to one. That's another equilibrium. And a third equilibrium would be for, of course, both the paths to miscoordinate. Here's another equilibrium. And so what's happening here is that even in this very, very simple network, you can have a variety of outcomes. Okay, so uh, this is familiar to us from the earlier lecture that you have structure doesn't pin down behavior as, as clearly as we would like. Um, and so what we did to get a better understanding of how structure and market power interact, we ran some experiments. Okay, so now I want to talk about those experiments. Okay, so what we did was we wanted to have the rings because that's where you get all this variety, but we also wanted to have critical players. And so this network, uh, you know, allows for critical players to get that, just to see that. So imagine that the source is F2 and the destination is E1. Then you have two critical traders, F and E, and you have, um, you know, you have to go through F and E. Okay, so they are, they are critical. So as long as the source is one of the spokes, uh, you're going to have a critical player. Okay. So what we wanted to do was to ask, remember the theorem says that 
um, you can have multiple equilibria. And in fact, this example tells us that criticality is not necessary for market power. We know it's sufficient, but it's not necessary. So what the experiments are going to do is uh, they're going to tease out whether which equilibria are played in these different networks. So for instance, in the rings, do you play the Bertrand type outcome with zero prices, or do the intermediaries have market power? And for example, here, we would like to know uh, which equilibrium is played. Uh, is it the case that critical players extract most of the surplus, or is it possible that non-critical traders who are sitting on the ring extract some of the surplus? Okay. So this is the design of the uh, experiment. We have four treatments. Um, the ring treatments, four, six, and 10. These are the sizes of the rings. And we have the ring six with hubs and spokes. Um, we ran two sessions per network treatment, and each treatment had, uh, each session had 60 rounds. So you fix the network. Let's say you fix this network, or you fix this network, the ring network. There are 10 players, uh, and you uh, run it 60 times. Okay, and um, and the only thing is that in each round you reallocate the position of the players between the different rings that are being played. Okay. So. Uh, to give you a sense, when I'm looking at ring n equal to 10, um, I'm having, uh, uh, you know, I'm having session one and, and session two. And uh, so I have 20 players coming in, so I'm really having 120 rounds of uh, data. Okay. And so that's the design. And let me just pause and make sure that you're with me with the experimental design. Okay, so there are these four treatments and each of them is being tried twice. Okay. Sure yes. You just mentioned that criticality is sufficient but not necessary for market power. When, um, I don't understand because how can, how can criticality be necessary when there are no intermediaries? Yeah, so, so in this uh, example, um, there are two paths. So nobody is lying on all paths. None of these four traders is lying on all paths. So there's no critical trader. On the other hand, there is an equilibrium, the green equilibrium, in which the lower path extracts full surplus because the upper path is miscoordinated. Okay, so the two intermediaries below have market power even if they're not critical. That's right, so it's not necessary. Okay, so, um, so what we want to do is we want to understand whether the traders are able to coordinate in these rather complex environments. These rings are quite, some of these rings are rather big. And secondly, how is the surplus allocated between the different traders and what's the role of criticality? So the first result is that in all the treatments um, and in all the sessions, uh, we have essentially full efficiency. Okay, so the first column here is telling us that in these, this is ring four, these are the different treatments. And even in the ring with hubs and spokes, where, which is a very complicated network with many different possible uh, routes and, and uh, quite a sophisticated coordination problem, we have a 95% trade. Uh, so 95% of the cases you get trade. Uh, and notice that in ring 10, even when people are five nodes, uh, distance five apart, you have 100% trade, which is quite striking. Okay. So, and this, this finding is, is, is actually echoes uh, some of the work that, that Shahar did early on with Douglas Gale on trading in networks, where in a, uh, in a slightly different framework, uh, it's closer, in fact, to the transport networks framework, they, they got 100%, close to 100% efficiency in trading in, in networks. Okay. Excuse me. Can yes. I ask you, uh, so in this experiment, you assign, in, for example, 82 people who have to trade with each other, and then the others can set prices? 
Yes, so I didn't get into the details of that, yeah, to make the problem interesting. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any trade if you assign them to adjacent places here. So you would randomly see, for example, assign A and B, they have to trade with each other, or for Yes, so let me step back a little bit. So what happens is that um, I'm going to have four traders, and I'll assign them. Let's look at a round. I've fixed a round. I assign them to these places. And then uh, I now pick the source and destination. And to make that interesting, I want them to not be adjacent, because then there would be no, no point in the data. But I want to do that, in fact, in the other rings as well. So I only pick the cases where they are. Yeah. Okay, so, so now remember the, the theorem told us that, um, that the equilibria will be extremal. So either if, if trade occurs, you'll either have full extraction or full retention. So this um, picture summarizes the data on surplus division between the intermediaries and the source and destination. And on the x-axis, you have the different treatments. Uh, so you have ring four, ring six, ring 10, and the ring with hubs and spokes. On the y-axis, you have the intermediation cost. That's the amount of surplus extracted by the intermediaries. And so the first part here on the left of the panel, we have the rings which have whether there are no critical traders, and essentially most of the surplus remains with the source and destination, and this intermediation cost is less than 20%. Uh, remember that the surplus here is 100. So on the other hand, uh, when I go on to the right side of the panel here, I see that if the number of paths is one, um, and, and then you know, there are two, um, you, you know, the, the, so there's basically one critical player or two critical players, I see that the surplus extraction is almost 100%. Okay. And as I have more critical players, this is the number of critical players, and as I look at path lengths, different path lengths, different possible configurations, I see that there is some variation here. It is still in excess of 70%. Uh, and as soon as I have zero critical players in that treatment with hubs and spokes, in fact, surplus extraction falls dramatically to less than 30%. So the takeaway here is, on the one hand, um, you know, you, you have extremal outcomes. Uh, and on the other hand, which of the two extremal outcomes arises depends on whether you have critical traders or you don't have critical traders. Okay. So this uh, table uh, looks a little more closely at the data. Remember, there were 60 rounds. So let's just focus our attention on the last 20 rounds. Uh, what is this saying? It's, let's look at this first row. Um, it's saying that if there's one critical player, there are two paths. Uh, there's a, the, the shortest path is distance three. The, the longer path is distance five. We see that 70% of the surplus uh, goes to the critical traders. Okay. Um, and, and similarly, you know, in the other cases, you have, uh, so in all these cases, you see that most of the surplus uh, stays with the critical traders. Um, so this is uh, going to come up now. I'll make that a little more. Um, so this picture gives you a good idea about what's happening. So this is a treatment um, where you have the source sitting here, the destination sitting here. And so what, what's going on is that you have this player here as the critical player. And you have two paths. You could go down on the left, or you could go across on the right. Okay, these two paths, okay, will will be the non-critical players. So it's interesting to ask um, what's going to be played. And to see the complexity of the problem, let me just show you that um, a variety of equilibria are possible here. So. Uh, just to get a sense of that. So let me just draw this source, and you have this destination. So let me leave the rest. 
Okay. So, what you see here is uh, the simpler, simplified version of that picture. And I just want to show you how complicated the problem is because here you could have another equilibrium with the following structure where these guys all set a prize 100. This guy then sets a prize 100 and the critical trader sets a prize 0. Okay. If you think through this, you will see that this is an Nash equilibrium. This is an Nash equilibrium in which the longer path has miscoordinated and gone out of the market. The non-critical trader is setting a price 100. And the critical trader is actually forced to set a price 0. That is a Nash equilibrium in this model. Okay. So what we are finding uh, is that all these um, equilibria don't arise in the experiment in the lab. What you see in the lab is most of the surplus uh, goes to the critical player. And indeed, um, the other interesting feature of this thing is that the shorter path sets a higher price compared to the longer path, but they are competing very hard. So in fact, the, they are very, very similar on average. Okay. Uh, the same thing happens here. You see that the long path traders are setting a lower price compared to the shorter path. And uh, um, so, so this is what we see in the lab. And uh, so if you just back out and you look at what's going on in terms of the trade routing, you see that reflected in the routing of the trade. Uh, because these paths are so competitive, uh, trade often occurs on the longer path. Uh, so uh, trade occurs on the shorter path two-thirds of the time. In other words, one-third of the time it happens on the longer path because they are so competitive. Okay. And you can see this at the micro level in terms of the pricing. And so you see that the critical trader sets a very high price. The short path player sets a lower price. And the, uh, the long path trader sets an even lower price. Okay. So, so this is the uh, nature of the behavior. So what's really going on is that you are um, criticality matters and the length of the path matters. People use that to coordinate on prices. Okay. So, so what we've learned from this uh, very short and uh, quick presentation is theory says that efficient equilibria exist, but lots of inefficient equilibria also exist. In the lab, we find that subjects almost always coordinate in efficient outcomes. Now, this is uh, consistent with a very long tradition in, on efficient market behavior in, in the laboratory. The division of surplus, uh, the theory says it will be extremal. Either all of it will stay with the source and destination, or all of it will go to the intermediaries. And in the lab, you see that it's not quite, uh, you know, it's not quite zero one, but it's pretty extremal, and it really. Uh, and and finally, the which of the two outcomes arises depends on the existence of critical traders. So the theory tells us that criticality is sufficient, and the lab. Uh, data reveals to us that it's sufficient and necessary. Okay. So, um, so, so what we've got is we've moved a long way forward from the theory. On the one hand, we have um, found, uh, we've, we've been able to show that in the lab people convert, you know, the, the, the coordinate and efficient outcomes. And on the other hand, we have found that they are sensitive to node structure, the, the network structure, and in particular, uh, node criticality plays a key role in uh, getting people to coordinate on, on prices and on surplus. Okay. So, so let me just pause and, and you know, ask you if there are questions. 
Uh, I've gone through it quite maybe a bit quickly, but, but yes. So uh, I don't know whether I clarified the way the treatment, the design is set up. So the way we set up the design is, uh, um, so, so let me just go back a bit to get this design a bit. I think essentially the, the response is that uh, the possibilities of coordinating are quite limited uh, because you would think that you would be coordinating through a repeated sort of game effect. But what's really going on here is that um, we are uh, reallocating players across rounds. So today, if I'm nice to you, tomorrow I may not be in the game because I may be in another game. So that doesn't completely eliminate the thing because if you look at the data here, what we have here, for instance, is um, for example, look at this, there are 18 subjects. So in a round, there will be three rings of six players each. And so in the next round, they will be reallocated. Some of them will be in the same ring, but some of them will be in a different ring. And so that comes in the way of coordination across rounds to, to some extent. And, and the fact that behavior is so different across treatments suggests that um, the repeated game effect, which is common across all of them, is, is probably not first order. Okay. Um, yeah. And did you give any explanation for the experimental outcome? So, um, so let me, the, the different ways in which I could think about your question. So, one way of thinking about it would be for instance, to um, look at this picture and say that what's really going on is um, there's some noise in this model. People are not actually choosing the best response. They are choosing different prices. And they are, there's some noisy best response. And because I know you're doing noisy best response, I'm also doing a noisy best response. And uh, that could be one way of accounting for the data. Uh, I don't know if that's, if that would be one track to take. If that would lead us to something like quantal response equilibrium. Um, another way to think about this problem, and I, and we, okay, so before I go on to that, I should say that Indeed, we have actually mapped this data into a noisy best response model. And uh, so what, what have we done there? We basically looked at, um, so what I do is I look at data on behavior, pricing behavior in the past, and then I ask, uh, how should I best, how should I respond? Uh, and I, I specify a noisy best response model and I can work out, I can estimate the noisy best response model using the data. And so I get a noise parameter. And then using the noise parameter, I can now simulate the, the, the pricing I would have. And, and I would try and match that with the observed data. Okay, so I was not planning to talk about that at length, so it's not in the slides, but it's in the paper. And so that's one track you can take to account for this data. Another way to account for this data, and, and it's, I think, maybe a little more interesting, and um, uh, is, is to actually account for it more as a, from a theory point of view. Okay. So, and that's the track we are working on now, and I was planning to spend some time talking about that. So, so what you can do, uh, and, and let me sort of step back a little from this model. Uh, so, so what I want to do is take you back to this. Um, okay, so 
so what I've done so far, and uh, there's a payoff expression. What I've done so far, I have made the assumption, very strong assumption, that only the cheapest path is picked. Okay, so if you're on the cheapest path, you could be picked. If you're not on the cheapest path, you make zero uh, profits. That's what this payoff, this payoff function one tells us. But you might think that if I were to go back to this uh, example, uh, I may sometimes pick a more expensive route because um, you know, I have those preferences. Okay, so in other words, these paths may not be perfect substitutes. Okay, so in other words, the, the, these paths are differentiated goods. And if they are differentiated goods, it may be that I may have more margin. I may set a higher price, I may lower my demand, but I may still be in the business. Okay, so that's the route we are exploring, and I want to, I'll take some time and talk about that. Uh, and then once you write down a model like that, in fact, you are in the world of differentiated price, differentiated oligopoly. Okay, and what you can do when you do differentiated oligopoly is that you can actually solve uh, for, uh, for the equilibrium of the differentiated oligopoly model. And, 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 you know, and then when you take limits, you get to this model. Yes. So and I, I, I'm going to talk. Is that addressing your question? Yes. So if you, if you take that path, you have to go through the difficult process of actually assigning preferences to all you know, utilities in some sense to all these different paths, right? Or yes. In some ways. Another way of introducing you know, market power, which you can then shrink, is just to introduce trembles. Yes. Have you thought about that? Yes. So, so this is, so trembles here, you mean trembles in behavior. Yeah. Yes. So, but yeah. that's so actually closer. Choose a higher cost path with some small probability. That's right. Yes. So, okay. So we have not done that. We have not done that. But that's, that's an interesting point. We haven't done that. Um, no, we haven't done, but I'm wondering whether one could approximate that. No, we haven't done that. Don't think yeah. in real time. No, no, we haven't done that. But yeah, are there any other questions? I wanted to spend more time on the linear model, uh, and, and then I'll change slides and so on. But I won't. Are there any questions on this? So, f on this yes. I was going to ask a slightly broader question, not particularly related to the experiment you published. So I guess I had a comment on it as well. Sure. Yes, so there are sort of different ways of, you know, I, there are actually a number of different ways in which one can respond to your question. I think strictly narrowly interpreted, your question is about the scope of an experiment like this. What does it really tell us which is interesting? Okay. And so to some extent, the, uh, the, the simplest response is uh, the experiment is only somehow, in a narrow sense, interesting to the extent the theory is interesting. Um, and, and so what I've tried to convey here is that you you can get a lot of mileage you know, by writing down the theory model and then taking it to the lab and learning a lot about selection. I find personally what's interesting is that it, it sort of motivates further theoretical work. Okay, so that's one response one can have, that one writes down very simple models. The advantage is that the mechanisms are very clear, very crisp, and, and then you can look at whether these mechanisms work in the lab, and uh, maybe you're going to find some other things are happening. And that helps you write, you know, feeds back onto models. Okay, uh, and that's that's the point of this part of the lectures. Of course, one can make a one can 
take a different route, which is the point I think maybe you were trying to get at. What is the, you know, what does one learn in terms of the scope of these experiments? And that's a very familiar point about, you know, the scope of experiments. In you know, they have, in my sense, of the scope is limited by the interest of the theory. But maybe Shahar wants to come in. Uh, oh, yes, so. uh, I actually think it's a, it's a perfect answer. It's a, the experiment is not further away from reality, whatever it means, than the theory is further away from reality. And uh, I would call this type of experiments uh, wind tunnel experiments. It's like we have the design of an airplane. Uh, we first put it in a wind tunnel. And basically what we want from this experiment is to learn and to feed back into the theory. Later on, of course, uh, the second level, I think that Sanjeev also mentioned, is the external validation of this, uh, of this experimental result. Now, um, I think in uh, experiments on individual decision making, it's easier to achieve. It's also hard, but it's easier to achieve external validation if I have experimental data on subject, and then real world, or at least I have some uh, observable some characteristics. In uh, experiments that are about strategic decision making, uh, not only network experiments, it's of course it's uh, it's much harder to achieve. Um, so I think I repeated what Sanjeev said basically. Okay, I was actually hoping to. Yeah, are there any other questions? Okay, so let me go back to the uh, point I was making to, to, to Arun, which is that what we did after these experiments, uh, let me show you again this uh, slide because I think it's quite illustrative of what's happening, um, was to ask ourselves, well, maybe what's really going on is that people you know, for one reason or another, maybe for the reason Larry was saying, that they're not actually picking, they don't think these people are picking the cheapest path. Although in the computer, uh, so although in the experiment, I should say, uh, uh, the computer was picking the path. So there was no tremble, in fact, in the experiment, in the true experiment, okay. But having said that, I mean, I think the, the route we took, uh, which is the subject of what we are doing now, is to imagine that these paths are differentiated goods, okay? And uh, so let me just explore that a bit on the board here. So what's going on is, so, so now the demand for a path Q, given some price G and a network G is given by you know, the differentiated demand system, uh, which, for example, I could write as A minus B, P, Q, where Q is this path I'm looking at, plus D summation, P, Q prime, Q prime is not equal to Q, okay? So this is a very familiar object. Uh, if you've done any industrial organization theory, this is a standard um, textbook sort of a model. All I've done here is uh, this Q, okay, is a path. It's no longer a single good, uh, but it's a path, and this path Q is, the P of Q is simply going to be the sum of the prices of all the players who are lying on path Q. So now what happens is, you, as you can see, uh, if you write down, uh, what's really going to happen is, for a player, uh, the payoffs are now going to depend on the price of everyone, uh, but it's going to be, you know, it's going to be pi i of p g is going to be some price p i times the sum of demands across all paths. Okay. Where this Q, um, you know, you, you're going to basically sum across all the Q on which I lies. So, so now you can see that 
we are getting into a linear quadratic system. Okay. And uh, what's going to happen is that these paths, Q, in fact, are capturing the network. Okay. And you're having this A, which is the size of the market, and you're having D, which is the substitutability across the paths. Yes. Yeah. This is a standard model in sort of differentiated oligopoly. Yeah, but when you think of it in a part in a graph, don't just try to understand why you would have it. I mean because there could be you think the demand is higher when the price is in the other parts are high. Yeah, that is standard by the way. Okay, so maybe I should back out a little bit and I mean maybe the confusion here is that Okay, so I should add that you can derive this linear system from a, consu from a consumer optimization problem. Okay, so a standard consumer optimization problem, you can derive this linear system. Now, in that system, this is a very standard formulation. So if you had, you know, a bunch of goods and they're differentiated, uh, then, you know, you're going to have this structure. This is nothing very new. I mean, I, I don't want to talk about that. This is not the forum for that, okay? And so it is true that as the prices go up, uh, my market becomes better and my demand goes up. That's just a feature of the system. Okay? This is not something I'm introducing. It's a familiar thing. Okay? Now, what, as, as I said, once you have this system, it's a linear quadratic system. Now what you can do is you can um, write it down in terms of when you take first order conditions, you're going to get a linear system. Okay, so that we are familiar with. It's actually somewhat related to the system we were working with in the complements game. Okay. Now, so what's really going on here, if you, if you pause and think a little bit about this, is you're going to have this sort of a structure. Okay, and what you're going to get is you will have these prices One, two, three, four. And you can see, if you, if you think about it for a moment, you will realize that the prices of one and two are actually substitutes because they lie on a single path in the simple example. And it's easy to see that if one pushes up its price, two has to lower its price. On the other hand, when three pushes up its price, in fact, it's good news one and two both raise their price. It's a complements problem. Okay. Uh, not only that, but in a more in a general framework, this is a very simple network. So if I took a more a richer, um, a richer network, what's going to happen is whether my prices are substitutes with you or complements with you is going to depend on how many parts I lie. If I lie on a lot of parts with you, the substitutes relationship will dominate. But if I rely on very few parts with you, then the complements relationship will dominate. So what's going to happen is the prices in this uh, problem, when you wrote, write down this uh, game and you solve it, look at the first system of first order conditions, um, you're going to get a system where uh, you will have, depending on the structure of the network, these prices will either be complements or substitutes uh, between any two pairs. So given a network, you will have a mix, generally. Some price pairs are going to be complements, and others will be substitutes. Okay. So once you, um, once you do that, you actually get this linear system. And once you solve that, you essentially get Bonacci centrality okay, of a suitable network. I haven't spent any time explaining the matrix that comes up. But essentially, you get an adjacency matrix. And this adjacency matrix has this property that the cells, the entries in the cells, are weighted um, uh, depending on how many parts I lie, how many I share with you, and how many I don't share with you, and so on. Okay, so the weighted directed graph is going to arise, and we are going to look at the Bonacci centrality of that graph. Okay, and the interesting point is that when you take limits in that network problem, 
So when you take limits, you can do, take a variety of limits, but basically if you, um, if you take the limit where you make this problem perfectly substitutable, right? So essentially it's perfect substitutes when D goes to B, very roughly speaking, okay? When that happens, you essentially get the model we were working with earlier. Okay, so you get the Bertrand problem. So what, what this model does, and this is a response to Arun's question, once we had this data, the thought I had was that actually the model, uh, the, the model we are looking for is a smooth model because it has to have criticality, but it has to have path length in it. That's how subjects are behaving. And, and so I think the biggest reward for us of running this experiment is to write a smoother model uh, where, in fact, you get exactly this result. So if you solve that model, you're going to get this result that the interior equilibrium of this model, when you take the limit of B going to D, is in fact going to pick exactly the equilibrium where the critical players share the surplus equally and the non-critical players get nothing. That's a unique outcome. That's what you get in the data, more or less. And secondly, when you don't go to the limit, you're going to get these path length effects. Okay, the short path will set a higher price uh, compared to the longer path, and they will set a lower price compared to the critical trader. Okay, so that's the, um, that's the sense in which I think an experiment you know, uh, can have very, very uh, interesting, um, um, interesting rewards, I think, quite, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, there you get very similar price. I don't think I have it in here. It's in the paper, but, uh, yeah, I don't think we have it here. Yeah, or maybe it's here. Uh, I, don't ha I, I, I don't have a slide with that. So that's the sense in which um, the experiment motivated a new model, uh, which uh, I think is a very rich model, which shows how you can combine uh, so substitutability or, or, or complementarity arises as the property of the network, okay? And when you take limits, you get all these special cases um, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's just very, uh, very powerful, I think, okay. So let me just, uh, for time, okay. So, so let me just uh, wrap up um, and I think I'll, I'll leave this for you to read because it's a different model. And uh, let me open the floor to questions and, and also go back to the point that Larry was uh, raising about the limits of uh, studying social networks. But I'll, I'll come to that. It's a general uh, question. But let's, maybe there are other questions on this, um, on this because I've been a little... Uh, um, open-ended and a bit vague, uh, so, but, but I just wanted to give you a sense of um, how one can write down uh, a much smoother model and uh, when you solve it, uh, you get very, uh, very nice uh, compared to statics and you also get very results that can explain the data better. Yes, so, any questions? So maybe Larry, you want to do you want to come in and add something about modeling social networks? So. You mean modeling social? I mean the, the limits the of uh, yeah. Right, right. Um, uh, before I I I, I uh, uh, do that, I, I, I just want to say that there, it's interesting to contrast this with two other models that one can think of. Right? Uh -huh. um, and one is one is uh, is actually just just what would what would the general equilibrium model look like, right? And then the other one is to think about about. Uh, um, about about uh, you know uh, bid ask markets rather than you know posted price markets and all these institutional arrangements you know lead I think to different answers and and um, uh, and <clears throat> you know we should and, and and I think an interesting set of questions to ask right is the interaction of the network with the institutional structure 
right? And, and I'll just leave it. Yeah, maybe I should just uh, add to that that one could have pricing using auctions here, for instance. One could have pricing doing bargaining. Mm -hmm. One could do bid ask, uh, which is uh, in the spirit of, I think, what Shahar did early on with Douglas Gale. And, and uh, I think your work, of course, is mostly direct pricing, uh, Larry. Bid -ask you also did? I, with okay. David and Ava and yeah, I thought, okay, I, I didn't remember that. Okay, so, so there are different pricing protocols. And I didn't talk about this, but there is actually a slide in the presentation uh, which talks about the relationship with the BIDAS model. Mm -hmm. So what I've done uh, with the benchmark model, everything I've said uh, can be supported in a BIDAS model. But the converse is not true. The BIDAS model is richer uh, strategically. Um, we also have a characterization of a set of networks where they're equivalent. Um, but, but you're right, in general, um, uh, uh, yeah, in fact, Matt Lester here in, in the audience has got a very nice paper also on um, with auctions. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we also relate in our paper, there's actually a section relating this model with the auctions problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so that there is, I think there's a sense and in Rachel which, actually has an old paper on, on auctions, auctions yes, uh, which doesn't, which has, bipartite graphs. Mm -hmm. So I didn't talk about bipartite graphs, but there's a big literature on that, of course, yes. So let me, oops, let me leave you with that thought and, and then maybe we can talk a little more uh, in general terms about uh, modeling social networks. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really have time to talk about some of the literature, but hopefully this slide will give you a sense of how rich uh, and how lively this field is. Um, and, and this is, doesn't really cover the computer science literature, which is actually probably even more lively than the economics literature. So, um, um, so the exam will be Friday afternoon? <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK. Yes, thank you. Robert Solo, I read something that just yesterday that he wrote. It's in Roger Backhouse's book that I bought yesterday. I can't remember what it is. But he said something to the effect that what, part of what makes right, a, 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 a good theory right, is that it addresses the fact and it is parsimonious. Right? Um, and the reason, there's, a, there's a real reason why we want parsimonious models. And that is, is, that, is that models that aren't parsimonious, by, and we mean in some sense, thin, not lots of assumptions, not lots of structure, is that if we have results that rely on lots of structure, what do we do when our empirical work says the world doesn't work that way? What do we got? We don't have very much, right? So, 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 so parsimony is a, is a great virtue, um, and, and, and we should all keep that in mind, right? The purpose of doing theory is not to show off our fancy technique, right? Um, uh, in, in fact, I think quite the opposite, uh, and, and certainly that's what happens in job talks, I might add. So remember that. 
Uh, uh, So, so let me let me now say something about 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 some of the limits of using of using network models. And I want to and, and 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 now having now that we agree that parsimony is a virtue, I want to argue that sometimes networks are too parsimonious, right? You know this this quote of Einstein, right? But uh, you know we should we should uh, uh, we should write down models that are you know that are that are as, as simple as they. Uh, uh, you know, as simple as they can be to explain the phenomena and not simpler, right? And I think that, that networks actually have a bit of this characterization. Um, we have to be really careful, I think, in that, in that uh, um, you know, it's easy to get taken up. You know, the, the, we have all these modeling skills. We understand how systems work in, in ways that some other social science disciplines don't. It's now easy to be, get, to be swept away by the rich description that sociology and anthropology uh, have to offer about a lot of the phenomena that we're very interested in. Um, but some of that rich description, and sometimes we should ignore some of that for exactly the reasons that Rachel mentioned, that, that, that capturing that rich description doesn't add anything to the economic conclusions that we're gonna get. Um, but there are other times, in fact, when it really, when, when, when it really is important, and I just wanted to, 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 to mention a couple of those. Um, uh, so, so, and I want to begin, let me tell you one, one experiment, um, one paper that I know that was written by uh, um, Duncan Watts and a, uh, um, who actually was at Quinnell at one point, and a, uh, a, former, a, a former postdoc of a research group that I was involved in, and uh, Georgi Kosinets. And, and what they did was they had all of, the, uh, all of the email that went back and forth at Columbia University for um, either a semester or a year, I'm not sure, I think it might I said a year, but it might have been a semester. And, um, uh, and the good news is, of course, that all the, uh, the identifying information was hashed. So they didn't know who's from Columbia here. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, but they actually did know, I think, who were students and who were faculty, okay, um, and staff, right? So they had some, some cuts that way. Um, and then what they did was they wanted to look and see what the network relationships were in the data. And, 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 and to, to make a long story short, it really depends upon how you look at the data. If you look at a very short window of time, one way of doing this, you've got this time series, right? So you could take a, a short period of time, look at, say, what happens over a week, and then look at averages over the year of the week window. Um, you get out a network, right? If you stretch that out to a month, you get a different network, right? Um, and, and, and so the question is, you know, really, what is the network, right? If, if we are going to take some network out of that to do some analysis with, which is the right network, right? And, and, and what we should remember is, in fact, that oftentimes what we measure as a network, right, the network that we measure, that we observe, is, in fact, just a, 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 a trace of the, uh, um, you know, of some more complicated social process. Famous data set. Uh, comes from the United States called the Ad Health data set, right? And, and, and some of you probably know this data set and you know that it has um, information about social relationships, um, which is to say romantic and sexual relationships within a single high school. Um, and I'll actually show you a picture. Imagine that, that some of those relationships, this is high school, remember, are really volatile, right? And, and so if you say, this is the network, right? What are you really looking at? That's, that's, that's one issue, right? Um, you know, another issue is that, is that, in fact, social relationships are colored by much more than just do they exist or do they not, right? Um, relationships have capacities. I can rely on someone so much, but not others, but not more. I trust people to some degree, but not more, um, so on and so forth. This is a, uh, another limitation. Now, this actually can be talked about within the network framework by thinking about things like weighted graphs and stuff like that. But, um, you know, that's, it's, it's still a little bit limited. Another thing to think about is that, in fact, we don't have, have just one network out there, right? There are many networks in which we participate in, and in fact, we have another way of thinking about this is to say that there's a gigantic network of some kind um, out there, and, and different parts of that network get used for different kinds of social tasks. 
and these social tasks interact to a great deal. And this is something that has made me a little bit skeptical of the literature that you're going to talk about tomorrow on endogenous networks, because if we think about constructing a network for one thing, that's fine. But the networks that we have are a mix of networks that have been constructed for many different reasons, along with networks that we've in, been endowed with, right? And so on and so forth. And, and, and so all of this lends to a kind of complexity that I think that we need to be aware of when we write down a graph and say, here's the adjacency matrix, let's go. I, th I think so. It's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's kind of an interesting thing. On the one hand, you want to be parsimonious. On the other hand, it's, it's a mess out there. Right. So, you know, but, but the point of theory is to do just the right amount of... Uh, just the right amount of that. Yes. So, so and, and I think it's a, it's a nice uh, way of thinking about... I think networks probably face that because of it, it's, it's maybe they face this problem more than some other because somehow they're trying to get into the mess, the complexity. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a whole group of people who do complexity science. Um, so I think there's a... I mean, I suspect that the answer probably is that for que it depends on the question you're looking at, the time frame, for instance, the problem you're looking at. There are statistical regularities in networks. Depending on the question you're looking at, you know, they, they make sense. Uh, so, so I think, as in all these things, the devil is in the deep. <laughs> yeah, and that, that is actually the frustration right, in working with network stuff, because every, uh, you know, there's no, what general equilibrium got us accustomed to was this grand hermeneutic theory, right, that encompassed everything. There it is, excess demand function. Um, uh, my thesis advisor uh, once said in a lecture on general equilibrium theory, he came in one day to lecture on Scarf's algorithm, he came with this big big grin on his face and in the French accent that I will not attempt to imitate, he said, he said, now we know how to find the zeros of the excess demand function. All we have to do is estimate it and then we're done. Right? And we could not tell whether he was joking or not, right? It wasn't clear. Um, um, but that's the kind of thing that, you know, that's our, that's our intellectual heritage, right? And it's really not helpful for lots and lots of things. It's not helpful if you want to do political economy, right? It's not helpful, I think, also if you want to do networks but it is frustrating to think that if you, if you, and it's frustrating for me in particular, since I grew up in this general equilibrium paradigm, right, to say that if I, if I write down a model of something, no matter how general I make it, it's only one tiny little piece, right? It's a little flotsam, jetsam in the, in the whole ocean of, of things that one, that, that, that one could do. Um, one thing I think, I think to think about in, 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 in doing empirical network work, and also theoretical network work, work is to um, is to think about the durability of the relationships that you're that you're that you're that you're working with. So um, there's a time scale for relationships, right? And all the relationships that we're involved with, you know, we know how long different kinds of relationships last for. And then also there's a time scale for action, the actions that you might take, right? That are influenced by a social network. And what you want to have is you want to have a good match, right? Of the uh, of, of, of these two time scales, right? So that in particular, if the time scale of, 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 of network change or relationship change is slow relative to that of action, right? Then talking about the kind of static network models that we have today is just fine, right? If on the other hand, that's reversed, right? Um, we really need to look at, 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 at very different models, maybe, um, and, and where it maybe in some sense the network isn't the driver at all, um, and of course, the in-between cases is, is, is exactly where theory always falls down. So, you know, that's 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 kind of a kind of a guideline. And and I think of that when I choose particularly inept examples for lectures, as I will probably do throughout tomorrow. Okay, I think we are out of time, and uh, um, so we are meeting tomorrow at nine for refreshments, and the first lecture is at nine thirty. Uh, so, look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.